I want to get into a message here tonight that's really kind of an extension of the subject this morning, and uh, it's, it's the flip side. You know, the Bible does remind us of the fact that we have a carnal nature, and uh, that carnal nature needs to be crucified. How many times does the carnal nature need to be crucified? <laughs> Once. And uh, so... That's the only time you do it, and then from there on, you're supposed to look back at that event, and when the carnal nature tries to reappear in your life, you reckon yourself dead. You reckon yourself crucified with Christ. So it's something you do once, it's not something you do every day. Now, the Bible does say we take up the cross daily, and uh, so we do that, and uh, I think that has to do with realizing that... uh, God has a path for us to walk, and He won't always choose the easiest way for us, and that requires taking up the cross and and walking with Him and allowing Him to lead us in a sold-out Christian life. So, uh, the flip side of this whole idea that we have a carnal nature that's been crucified is uh, the fact that we also have the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says this, Uh, Everybody's familiar with 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. Most of y'all can quote it. Uh, It goes something like this. God has not given us the spirit of fear, right? But he's given us a spirit. And that spirit is one of power, love, and a sound mind. That describes the Holy Ghost. The spirit of fear uh, will rob you of love. It'll rob you of a sound mind. You're going to be a miserable goat to be around uh, if you have the spirit of fear in your life. And so that's a good thing to get rid of. You don't need him. It is a spirit. Now, there is such a thing as human fear, but if you don't keep the human fear in check, it opens the door to a demonic spirit that comes and controls you and manipulates you. But what most people aren't aware of is there in 2 Timothy chapter 1 is the verse prior to chapter 7 or verse 7, which is verse 6, and it says this, it says that we are to stir up the gift that's inside of us. And I believe that gift, uh, if you want to know what that is, is not necessarily talking about your personal spiritual gift. It's not talking about your ministry calling. It's talking about the gift of the Holy Ghost because of verse 7. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and a sound mind. So the gift that you're to stir up within you is the nature of God. So you have a carnal nature, and you can stir that up as a Christian and walk in carnality. But what you need to be doing instead is stirring up the gift, and the word gift in in, uh, the Greek is the word charisma. You need to stir up charisma inside of you, the gift of the Holy Ghost inside of you, and walk in the nature of God. And so I want to I bring that flip side to you, because really, you know, in a lot of churches, they do emphasize that you need to die, and you need to crucify your flesh, and they, but, but they don't really tell you how to do it. And the way that you do it is you stir up the nature of God and uh, the power of God and the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. So with all that in mind, let's go to John chapter 16. I I want to read a couple of verses to you. Um, John 14, 15, and 16, Jesus begins to emphasize the need for him to go. He's constantly emphasizing this in these three chapters to his disciples, I'm leaving. And this is very disappointing to them because they see Jesus as the Messiah, they see Jesus as the answer uh, to their problems, the answer to Israel's problems as a nation. They see Jesus as the solution. And why would he be leaving? His work's not finished. He hasn't been crowned as Messiah. And why is he leaving? And so this brings great sadness to him. And in John 16, verse 6, Jesus says to the disciples, Because I have said these things unto you, sorrow has filled your heart. And so they were sad about the fact that Jesus was leaving. Who wouldn't be? Jesus had 
uh, become to them not only a Savior, a Messiah, but he had also become their friend. And uh, they enjoyed being around him. He was their Lord, their master, and he had taught them so many things, and now he was leaving. So great sadness fills their hearts. And in verse uh, 7, he tells them why he needs to go. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, of judgment. There's actually a teaching in the church that uh, Jesus no longer convicts us of sin. Well, that's uh, quite contrary to verse 8 here. He will reprove the world, and the world there, that word is cosmos, and so it basically means everything in the world, believer, unbeliever. He will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you in all truth, for he will not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you of things to come. Now, I've entitled this message, and, and I've been pondering on this thought. What exactly happened on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2? Um, what exactly happened? I've entitled this, What Happened on Pentecost? And uh, that's a question I've been pondering on personally because there's some debate uh, among theologians as to what exactly happened uh, on the day of Pentecost that changed the experience of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life. There's some debate as to what the Holy Spirit did for us under the Old Covenant in the Old Testament uh, compared to what he does for believers today. Now, very obviously, there was a moving of the Spirit of God in the Old Testament. And uh, uh, probably it could be best explained like this, that in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, he came upon believers. He still comes upon believers today, amen? We had these youth meetings, and Brother Jake came out of that thing with a revelation. He said, you know, I saw the Spirit of God coming on people. And, uh, but he said, what bothers me is some of those people never changed. And so it's, it's great that the Spirit of God comes upon us. That's a good thing. But we need the Holy Spirit to change us. And if you really want to experience change, you also need the Holy Spirit abiding in you empowering you, do, doing a work inside of you. And I personally believe that's what was missing under the Old Covenant. Something changed. Because Jesus said here in verse 7, He said, it's expedient that I go. There's something greater in the work of the Spirit that was supposed to happen that had not yet happened. And Jesus said, as long as I'm here, that can't happen. I have to go so that the Spirit, this new measure of the Spirit can be released inside of you. Something happened. Something unprecedented. Something that had not happened before happened on the day of Pentecost. Something different. Something unlike how they experienced it in the Old Testament, something different happened on the day of Pentecost. What was that? Well, John chapter 14 and verse 16 says, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide, everybody say abide, abide. that he may abide with you forever. So the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament would come upon people for a specific purpose for a specific task as you read about the judges god would raise up these judges men like samson and and uh, uh the different judges you can read about in the book of judges where the holy spirit would come upon them for a season for an hour for a specific time so that they could deliver israel out of captivity and uh the holy spirit still comes upon people today that hasn't stopped 
But yet there's a greater promise that's available to God's people that you and I need to get a hold of, and that's that the Holy Spirit, when you become born again, now comes and dwells inside of you. He abides within you. And this is something to get excited about because it's not something they had under the Old Covenant. Now, if you keep reading here uh, in verse uh, 17, it says, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. Notice this. The world cannot receive the Holy Spirit. You've got to be a born-again believer before you can receive the Holy Ghost. The world can't receive Him because it sees Him not, neither knows Him, but you know Him, for He dwelleth. Everybody say, dwelleth. dwelleth. He dwells within you and shall be in you. And so under this new covenant, it's no longer like it was in the Old Testament where He would come upon prophets and priests and kings and anoint them for a specific duty and a task. And when the duty and the task was over, the Holy Ghost would lift and they'd go home to be with their wife or whatever. Uh, I don't know how all that worked. I don't know if he stayed for a season or, you know, if he just showed up in the morning and then left again at 6 o'clock. I, I don't know how all this worked. But I know that it's, it was different then than what it is now under the new covenant because Jesus said, it is expedient that I go because there's a new work of the Spirit that's about to take place. And after I leave, I need you to go to Jerusalem. I need you to tarry there. I need you to wait there until the Holy Ghost comes upon you. Now, I get kind of a kick out of these uh, Pentecostals that say, I'm tarrying for the Holy Ghost. I've been tarrying for the Holy Ghost for five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. You know, after the Holy Ghost came on the uh, on the disciples on the day of Pentecost, there's no more need to tarry anymore. Uh, the, the, the tarrying was until the day of Pentecost. You don't have to tarry after that anymore. You receive the Holy Ghost. You receive the power of the Holy Ghost. You receive the gifts of the Holy Ghost. And if there's a blockage in your life that's hindering you from receiving, you find out what that blockage is and you repent of it and you renounce it in the name of Jesus but you receive everything that God has for you. Now, in John chapter 7 and verse 39 gives uh, more evidence that there was something going to take place uh, that had not yet happened. And Jesus said this, or says this, in, in, or it says in verse 39 of John 7, This spake he of the Spirit, which the, well, they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified, not yet given. Now again, they had the Holy Ghost in the Old Testament, but it had not yet been given as it was about to be given on the day of Pentecost. See, uh, now there's a, a glory in, in the, under the Old Covenant. They actually had the glory of God come into uh, the tabernacle or into the temple. Uh, the presence of the Lord was in a specific place, but it didn't dwell inside of people. And Jesus says, now you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is now going to dwell inside of you. And so what we have today is so much better than what they had under the Old Covenant, uh, under the uh, Old Testament and the Old Covenant. So um, let me take you through just a little bit of Scripture here. Uh, Luke 24 in verse 49. So the question again is, what is the difference today from what it was under the Old Covenant? How is it different? We know according to the Word of God that it is different, but how is it different? In Luke chapter 24, verse 49, one of the things that Jesus said to the disciples, He said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father. Everybody say the promise. How good is the promise? It's only as good as the person giving it, right? It's, it has to do with the integrity of the person making the promise. Now, is our Heavenly Father a God of integrity? He is. But there's a condition to the promise of the Holy Ghost. He said, they that believe. In other words, it requires faith to receive the Holy Ghost. And some people get into a works mentality. They think, well, if I do this, and if I do this, and if I do this, and if I dot my I's and cross my T's, uh, you know, I can have the Holy Ghost. Well, 
It's pretty hard to get religious people filled with the Holy Ghost. You know who some, Brother Rose told me this years ago, and I found it to be true. He said, the hardest people to get healed are Pentecostals. Why is that? Because they've learned to drum it up. And uh, I've found it to be that way. It is the hardest people get healed are Pentecostals because they're trying to believe, they're trying to put a religious oomph into their receiving. And they think if they stamp their feet a certain way and say hallelujah in a certain way or speak in tongues in a certain way that they can get healed. And, and, and you have to get out of that religious mindset. You know, the religious mindset is, just, is not just in the conservative Anabaptist people. It's also in the Charismatics and in the Pentecostals and in, in just about every denomination. It is. And so we have to guard our hearts from that because it's believing and it's trusting and receiving by faith that allows us to receive more of the Holy Ghost. Okay, let me finish reading my verse here. Luke chapter 24, verse 49. Behold, I send the promise of the Father upon you. Now, he's talking about something that's not yet happened. The outpouring of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. And he says, wait in Jerusalem, tarry in Jerusalem till that happens. But here's what he's tells them that will happen when the Holy Ghost comes upon them. He says, you will be endued with power. Everybody say power. power. Tell that person beside you, I need more power. <laughs> Somehow we have made it in religious circles. We've made it wrong to want power. Uh, I can tell you today, I was crying out to the Lord this afternoon for power. Uh, many of my prayers to the Lord has to do with, Lord, I need greater authority. I need greater anointing. I need greater power in my life. I need that. You need that. And we shouldn't be ashamed of that. It's a promise from the Word of God. And the problem with most Christians is they don't have any power. <laughs> and they should be crying out to God for more power. We need the power of the Holy Ghost on us. We need more power. And so this was the promise of the Father. When the power comes, or when the Holy Ghost comes... You're going to have power you didn't have before. Now, the power is to do what? Well, Acts chapter 1, verse 8 says this, You shall receive power after, after, after. Notice there's something happens first. After the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you'll receive power, and you're going to be witnesses. So the power is to be witnesses. The power is to walk in the Holy Ghost anointing, and to be able to release that anointing in other people's lives through the words that we speak, to be a witness and a testimony for the Lord Jesus. First in uh, Harrisonburg, and then in Virginia, and then all over the United States and the uttermost parts of the earth. And uh, so you start locally, you bloom where you've been planted, you, uh, <laughs> you walk through the open doors that God has already given you, and as you're faithful there, the Lord will open more doors to you. That's a kingdom principle. And so he said, you're going to receive power. Now, this is a promise. Now, let's stay focused on this word promise. If you go over to Acts chapter 1 and uh, verse 4, you will see this word promise again. And it says, being assembled together with them, and Jesus commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise. Everybody say promise again. And, and who's the promise from? It's the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard of me. See, Jesus kept emphasizing to something that was going to happen, and he kept referring to that something as a promise, but the promise is only as good as the person giving it, so he kept emphasizing the promise is the promise of the Father. The one who keeps his word. Your part is to wait in Jerusalem. If you wait in Jerusalem, you're going to get it. Everybody that was in that upper room got it. Now, it wasn't because they obeyed and went to the upper room. It was because they believed. And when you believe that there's something coming, you're going to be there when it comes. There's over 500 people that saw Jesus after he was resurrected from the dead, according to the Apostle Paul. How many people were in that upper room? Okay. So where's the other 380 people? They're in unbelief is what they were. Now, 
In their carnal mind, they had a reason not to be there. Every carnal person has a reason not to be there. They do. <laughs> it's interesting to me what carnal people come up with for excuses. I remember one time the Holy Ghost spoke to me. We were going on a camping trip. And I told our people, Saturday night of that camping trip, you want to be there. You want to be there. That's all I told them. That's all the Holy Ghost left me tell them. And everybody that was there, young and old alike, got filled with the Holy Ghost. Started speaking in tongues. We're talking little children. Five, six, seven. My little five-year-old son that night got filled with the Holy Ghost. Started speaking in tongues. Now, you know who didn't get it? The people that weren't there. They didn't get it. And they can say, well, that's not fair. We had reasons not to be there. Grandma invited us over that night. We had other things to do. We were out of town on business. And you know, the Lord took every excuse that they gave them and he accepted it. But they didn't get the Holy Ghost. The only ones that got the Holy Ghost were the ones that were there that night. And the only ones that got the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost, now some of those 380, hopefully they got, they repented of their carnality, repented of not being there. Maybe they got the Holy Ghost the day after or a week later or all of that. Maybe they got it later. Some of the ones that weren't there in Kansas did get it a few years later. Some of them still don't have it. Is God a mean God? He's not a mean God. But your faith will put you in the right place at the right time. Your faith will cause you to be led by the Holy Ghost. If you don't have faith, your carnal brain's going to kick in and make excuses and reasons why you're not there. <laughs> Amen. Good preaching, Brother Reuben. Yes, it is. So Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for... The promise. Now, let me give you another one. Acts chapter, uh, let's go to Acts chapter 2 and verse 4. So they're waiting for the promise. And uh, it, it says here that they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. There was a sound from heaven in verse 2. As a rushing mighty wind, it wasn't a gentle breeze, it was a rushing mighty wind. That's the Holy Ghost, this gentle breeze stuff. Uh, that's just, uh, that's not what God's got in mind. He, he's a Russian mighty wind. He wants to shake some things up. That's what God wants to do. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues as of fire. Verse 4, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, notice if you keep going down through here, because there's a lot of people, they want the Holy Ghost, but they don't want the tongues. And uh, so let me ask you a question. Does the promise of the Father come without tongues? <laughs> Good question. Let me go down to Acts chapter 2 and verse uh, 33. Here we've got this word promise again. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, which he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. With the promise, this baptism of the Holy Ghost, some people call it, other people don't like that, they say it's the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Well, call it what you want, whatever it is, it's, it's, it's something that didn't happen in the Old Testament. But with this promise, there's an evidence that it's come. A lot of people... Uh, that come from cessationist churches, you ask them if they're filled with the Holy Ghost, they say, yeah, based on the fact they've been born again. Well, they don't walk in power. They've not been endued with power from on high. They don't have enough of Holy Ghost anointing to blow out a candle, spiritually speaking. And we need the Holy Ghost, and we need power. And the Holy Ghost is here to empower you. And He's here to wake you up. And he's here to bring you out of your carn carnal way of thinking. And, and we need, so, so it's got to start with a hunger, and it continues with a believing. 
And it continues with a grace to be able to receive. And you're saying, I need this in my life. I've got to have this in my life. Which you now see and hear. Now, traditionally, the Pentecostals have told us that tongues is the evidence of the infilling of the Holy Ghost. I don't know if I agree with that or not. Uh, most of the people I've seen get filled with the Holy Ghost end up speaking in tongues at some point or the other. Um, but I will say this, that the Charismatics put it a little differently. They say that uh, speaking in tongues is one of the evidences, and I probably would prefer that approach. That's probably a slightly better approach, because uh, you can't actually speak in tongues and it not be of the Lord. You can be mimicking something and, and just uh, jabbering something and it not really be the Holy Ghost. And so there's people that mimic and jabber and they've never been filled and they say they're filled because they can mimic and jabber. And so what we want is we want a true and genuine experience with the Holy Ghost. Now, when my four daughters got filled with the Spirit, it was in a church service. And uh, uh, the Lord actually told me, because uh, my oldest daughter was 19 at the time, the youngest, I think, was nine. And uh, they had been crying out for the Holy Ghost since they were five years old when they'd gotten saved, and, and they just couldn't break through to the baptism. And uh, so I started uh, fasting and praying about this when Shana turned 19. I got the girls to start fasting and praying uh, for the first time in their lives. They learned to know what it was to go without food for 24 hours and, and then 36 hours and so on and so forth. And as we began to fast and pray, the Lord spoke to me. And he said, they can't receive inside your circles because they're under pressure to perform. And... Uh, they're under condemnation because they don't have the Holy Ghost. So I said, well, what do we do about this? He said, well, take them outside your circles. And he said, they'll relax and receive the Holy Ghost. Well, that's what we did. And may I put a caution out there. Don't you be running just anywhere to get the Holy Ghost. Get yourself in a mess. But uh, for them, uh, we sought the Lord till we got the word of the Lord. We weren't just going by some, uh, some idea. And so when my four daughters went to a church service and the power of God was released, and there was specific teaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I was the one up there laying hands on them, one at a time. And we started with my daughter and my oldest daughter. I laid my hands on her, and boom, she got it. She began to speak in tongues. Second one got it. She began to speak in tongues. The third one got it. She began to speak in tongues. I laid my hands on the fourth one, and she got it, but she didn't speak in tongues. So what do you do with that? She did what every good Mennonite does. She let the Holy Ghost fill her, and I could see the Holy Ghost filling her, and she got all filled up right up to here. Now, if you let it go past here, your tongue begins to kind of uh, do strange things. But she stopped it right, right here because she was scared. She didn't want to speak in tongues. She did the Mennonite thing. She stopped it right here. I think there's probably some pretty good Mennonites out there been filled with the Holy Ghost, but they don't speak in tongues because they stop it right here because they're scared to. Now, let me give you one of the keys to speaking in tongues. The Bible says that they spoke in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. In other words, the Holy Spirit was not doing the speaking. You've actually got to move your lips. You've got to make sound through your vocal cords, and you've got to move your tongue. And if you refuse to do that, you stop the Holy Ghost right here, and you never speak in tongues. And you say tonight, well, what's the big deal about speaking in tongues? I don't really want to speak in tongues. Well, that's because you're carnal. Carnal people don't want to speak in tongues because they can't understand what they're saying. When you become spiritual, you'll want to speak in tongues. I want to speak in tongues. And I cried out to the Lord for that thing. If you fill me with the Holy Ghost, I want to speak in tongues. And uh, so I said to my youngest daughter, Mariah, I said, okay, we're going to pray one more time. I'm going to ask the Holy Ghost to fill you again. This time, don't stop it. Don't be a good Mennonite. Be a bad Mennonite. And uh, I didn't really tell her that, but I thought it. <laughs> and so I prayed for her one more time. And again, the presence and power of God came in and filled her. And again, that Holy Ghost anointing, you know, it starts in your innermost being. The King James actually says it starts in your belly. And uh, that's kind of a vulgar word, but that's what the Bible says in the King James Version. The nicer versions, they say, in your innermost being. So again, the Spirit of the Lord came up to here, 
And this time I put my hands on either side of her, her neck and I said, be loosed in Jesus' name. And just like that, she began speaking in tongues. So that thing just, it just, it just came. And that's actually an act of faith. It's a step of faith that you're going to take. Now, some people, uh, they get into this big debate on whether we should coach people to speak in tongues or not. Um, if, whether we should educate them, whether we should show them how to do it. And, and I would prefer the Holy Ghost do it. But with some people, sometimes they need some help. They need some explaining so they understand this thing because they think the Holy Ghost is going to do everything. You're going to wait the rest of your life and never speak in tongues if you think the Holy Ghost is going to do it all for you. They spoke in tongues, the Bible says, as the Spirit give the, gave them utterance. So the Spirit gives you the syllables. Sometimes people see the syllables in their mind. Sometimes they just feel an urge to say something. But if you don't take that step of faith and begin exercising your vocal cords and open your mouth and begin speaking, you'll never speak in tongues. Okay, that was for somebody. I had not planned on saying all of that. So somebody in here needs that. Tell that person beside you, that might be you. Okay. So, here we are in Acts uh, chapter 2. And by the way, Acts chapter 2, we also see a transformation of an apostle by the name of Peter, who just a few chapters before this, a few days before this, Jesus is being crucified and he doesn't have enough of courage inside of him to tell a young lady that he's a follower of Jesus. And he ends up denying Jesus. But the Holy Ghost comes upon this same timid, scared individual, and he is transformed into this powerful spiritual being that stands up in front of thousands of people on the day of Pentecost, and he says, you men of Israel... You that crucified this Jesus, you need to repent. And if you repent and if you're baptized, you'll receive this same gift of the Holy Ghost. And I mean, he starts preaching with power and 3,000 people get saved. Now that's a transformation. That's what happens when the Holy Ghost comes on people. And brothers and sisters, I'm here to say today that we are doomed to carnality if we don't get the Holy Ghost. We need the Spirit of God, and I need you to have a hunger and thirst inside of you like you've never had before for more of the gifts of God and the goodness of God and the power of God. I remember uh, now Jesus said, here's the evidence of the Holy Ghost. He didn't say you're going to speak in tongues. He said you'll be endued with power. There's going to be a power coming on your life. I remember soon after I got filled with the Holy Ghost, I got a phone call right out of the blue. One of the leaders in our church called me up and said, I'm going into the Lancaster Water Street Rescue Mission, and I'd like to take you along. I said, I'd love to go. Here I am, fairly newly saved, just been filled with the Holy Ghost, and so we're on the way in. And he looks at me, and he says, you're preaching tonight. Boy, I felt like shriveling up. <laughs> I didn't like the idea of talking to other humans more than one uh, at the same time. <laughs> I could talk, but not to a room full of people. And something happened, uh, happened to me when I got behind that pulpit because there was a crowd about this size. And I got up behind that pulpit and I began to share the testimony of how God had saved me out of drugs and alcohol and turned my life around and I just began to share and I felt this presence of God just this strength this grace that was on me it was not of myself it was a power and all of a sudden I saw God's moving on the hearts of individuals they're nodding their head they're leaning in they're listening and at the end I said how many of you would like to get saved and give your life to Jesus and we had five men that night come up and give their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the first time I ever led anybody to the Lord. And to me, that was, that was just, that was such a thrill. And I realized afterwards that wasn't me doing it. It was the power of the Holy Spirit inside of me. And brothers and sisters, if we can, if we can yield to that power, if we can yield to, go, to the governing hand of the Holy Spirit in our lives, that's what's called spirituality. And it is the antidote 
The carnality is to be spiritual, to be led by the Spirit, to be governed by the Spirit, and to be endued with power from on high. John Wesley shares a story. Now, he started the Methodist movement, the Methodist denomination, and uh, this is not my opinion. This is the opinion of one of their head elders who just started coming to our church about a year ago. He said, he said, uh, most of what I see in this movement right now, he said, that, that he said that it's just, they're dead. They're bringing in the rainbow crowd and, and uh, catering to that crowd. And he said, there just isn't much going on anymore. So he was looking for a new church. And uh, that was his opinion. But old John Wesley, the founder of that denomination, uh, had the power of God on his life. Now, he was a, a flaming evangelist that led thousands of people to the Lord in his lifetime. But what a lot of people don't know is that early in his walk with God, uh, he had a difficult time leading people to the Lord. Nobody would listen to him. And he'd preach the gospel and nothing would happen. And he'd put sermons together and preach sermons and nobody would change. And he said, one night he said, I went to this prayer meeting and there was a bunch of old ladies at this prayer meeting. And he said, uh, I got kind of freaked out. Now that wasn't his words. He was, they had better words than freaked out back in those days. But uh, anyway, that's my interpretation of what he was saying. And he said, these old ladies came up to me, and they said, John, you need the power of the Holy Ghost. And they started laying hands on him and, and praying for him. And he said, they prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed most of the night. And he said, I'm not sure what happened. But he said, when I left there, I went back out on the streets, and I said the same thing I always said to people, and they started dropping on their knees and repenting of their sins and inviting Jesus into their life. He said, I wasn't saying anything different from what I'd said before, but there was a power on me that I didn't have before. And I'm here to say, I don't know if John Wesley ever spoke in tongues. There's arguments about whether he did or whether he didn't. Obviously, people that don't speak in tongues, they want to make it that he didn't. And those that uh, do speak in tongues, they want to make it that he did. So I wasn't there. I don't know if he did or not. But I do know this. He said, there's a power that came on me that night when those old ladies laid hands on me. And so maybe some of you ought to have some old ladies lay hands on you. So... What they didn't have in the Old Testament was a personal endowment of power for each individual. Yes, there was an anointing that would come upon a prophet, a priest, and a king occasionally for a task or a duty. But it wasn't the indwelling power and presence of the Holy Ghost. And I personally believe that this is an event that takes place after salvation. The power of the Holy Ghost comes upon you after you're saved through an event known as, some people call it the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and of course, uh, the cessationists got a problem with that because they say you get the baptism when you get born again. Others call it the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Whatever you want to call it, you need what John the Baptist described as the Holy Ghost and fire in your life. You need that, I need that, and, and I've had that, but I want more of it. And if you've had it, you need more of it. And the same people that got filled in Acts chapter 2, you go over there in Acts chapter 4, they get filled again. But there's an initial endowment of power from on high. And then there's seasons in your life where you need a fresh wind and a fresh fire of the Holy Ghost in your life. And so you keep seeking God. And calling upon the name of the Lord. Now, the second thing that I believe that was different after Pentecost from back under the Old Covenant. And by the way, when I'm referring to the Old Covenant, it lasts until Acts chapter 2. The ministry of Jesus was under the Old Covenant. The New Covenant came on the day of Pentecost. And there was a transition period in there. Obviously, and when Jesus was preaching the gospel of the kingdom, he was preparing people for the new covenant outpouring and a new covenant way of thinking. But that transition was taking place, but it didn't really, wasn't really uh, in full effect until the day of Pentecost. But there's something else happened on the day of Pentecost. It's found in John chapter 7. And Jesus is, is speaking of this on a feast day. Now, a feast day was a day where all the Jews gathered together to, to go through some kind of religious uh, ceremony. 
And Jesus, in the middle of this religious ceremony, he stands up, and the Bible says he cried with a loud voice. Now, can you imagine this? Can you imagine the stalest and the deadest denomination you've ever heard of? And you go there, and you be a part of their uh, religious, ritualistic uh, forms that they're going through. And in the middle of one of those things, somebody stands up and cries out with a loud voice, If any man thirst... You imagine doing that. Now, I'm not recommending this, but if you want to know what it looked like, try it sometime. <laughs> I'm sure it got the attention of some people. And he said, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. And then he said this, verse 38, he gives three requirements for the Holy Ghost in verse 37. In verse 38, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. I had been crying out for the Holy Ghost. My wife and I, we uh, decided that we needed more than just getting born again. And uh, getting born again was awesome, man. I got instantly delivered from drugs and alcohol. And, and man, I got free of so many things just by getting born again. I highly recommend it. Uh, the, uh, Jesus said that uh, uh, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven unless you're born again. And uh, if you're not born again, you go to that other place they call hell, the place nobody wants to preach about anymore. So that's the gospel message. So I highly recommend you get born again. If you haven't been born again, you ought to try it. But uh, a year into this born again stuff, I said, you know, there's something more. I was reading the book of Acts, and, and I was kind of being bugged because some of the old life wanted to come back on me. And uh, I said, Lord, there's got to be something more to this thing. And I began to cry out to God, and my wife and I, uh, we decided that whatever that event was in the book of Acts that they called the infilling of the Holy Spirit, that was the answer. And I said, we need that. We need that power. And so we began to fast. We began to pray. We began to seek the Lord. We began to memorize Scripture. And uh, we just we took time to seek God on this thing. And I remember one day we were in our living room, and I felt the presence of God come in. And I knew the Holy Spirit wanted to fill us. But uh, I didn't know how to get filled. And all of a sudden, there's this voice spoke to me, and it was actually an Old Testament verse. And the voice said, uh, it wasn't an audible voice, it was an inward impression. It said, open your mouth, and I'll fill it. And I remembered this scripture. Jesus said, if any man thirsts, first requirement for the Holy Ghost is to be thirsty. Let him come to me and drink. Second requirement, you got to open your mouth. You got to drink. And so I took a step of faith and I opened my mouth. And the moment I did, I felt this presence come inside of me. And I felt it down here. Back in those days, my belly wasn't as big as it is now, but I felt it down in my innermost being. And there was this welling up this welling up, and it got up to about here, and all of a sudden I felt my tongue bouncing around in my mouth. And I said, what's going on here? <laughs> Too late. I was already speaking in tongues. Now, some people don't get it that fast and get it that strong, but I want to say today that it's available to you by faith, but I had opened my mouth. If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink, and out of his belly, out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water he that believeth on me oh that's something else you got to do is you got to believe you got to believe the lord's going to do this that he wants to, he actually wants to fill you more than you want to be filled if you get a hold of that he doesn't want to withhold any good thing from his sons and daughters and so he wants to fill you this he spake of the spirit which they that believed on him should receive for the holy ghost had not yet been given because jesus was not yet glorified. And so when you are thirsty, when you drink, when you believe, you become a channel. Now, there's a river that comes from the throne room of God. That river hits your spirit man. But the Bible says, then out of you will this river become streams. I can, I can stand behind a pulpit and release that river when I'm preaching, 
By faith, I can release that river, and I can see streams going out to different people. I become a channel. I become a portal. These are, some people say these are New Age terms. No, they're terms they stole from the, from the Christians. You as a child of God, if you're in the kingdom of God, and you're full of the Holy Ghost, you represent the kingdom of God, and the river of God has hit your spirit, and then out of your river, out of, that, out of your innermost being, that river becomes streams of ministry that goes to different people and reaches out and touches different people in different people's lives. And it's amazing what all can happen if you yield yourself to the Spirit of God and you become that channel, that vessel that's meet for the Master's use to be poured out in other people's lives. And the more you pour out, the more God will fill you. People say, well, I haven't been filled in 30 years. Well, you need to pour some stuff out. <laughs> you need a minister. You need to have a compassion and a love for people that wants to help, that's willing to invest and, and pour into people's lives. There's times where I wonder where I'm going to get my energy to keep on going because I'm just, I've been poured out and I'm spent and I don't think I've got anything left in me. And all of a sudden that compassion will just well up inside of me. And when that compassion comes, there's just a, a fresh burst of energy, a fresh wave of the Spirit that's ready to be poured out again. It's amazing. Now, uh, one of the things that came with the Holy Ghost, so back in the time of David, now I would almost call David a New Testament believer. But if he wanted to know what to do next, he had to call priest. And they had this thing called the urn, and the, I don't know, what, does anybody know what they called that? The things that would light up on the high priest's uh, garb. Urim and Thummim, okay. And so they would have to ask questions, and depending which light would go off, they'd say that's a yes, or if another light would go off, they'd say that's a no. So the inward impression and leading of the Spirit of God was not like it is for you and I today, even in the life of someone like David. Brothers and sisters, we don't realize how privileged we are. We don't realize what we have access to inside of us, that spirit-to-spirit -spirit connection where our spirit is connected to the Holy Spirit, and we have access, the Bible says, to all things that pertain on the life and godliness. Isn't that amazing? And we've got that inward leading and unction, and sometimes we don't quite understand where the Lord's taken us. But by faith, you let Him take you, a step at a time. But we want to know the future for years out ahead. Well, He's not going to show that to you. His Word, by the Holy Ghost inside of you, is a lamp onto your feet a light onto your path and so I remember when we moved out to Kansas well we were planning on moving to Kansas I was asking the Lord for I didn't want to live uh, in most of Kansas where it's flat and windy and ugly so I told the Lord I'd like to have a slice of Pennsylvania right here in the middle of Kansas I know I'm called to be here but I'd like it to be a little bit like Pennsylvania wherever we go to now, is that selfish or is that carnality? <laughs> Apparently not, because the Lord honored it. And so one day we were leaving Kansas, and uh, we had been looking all over the place for this perfect place to buy. And I'd made a covenant with the Lord um, a year prior to that. We had sold our house, and the Lord had got us out of debt. And in addition to getting us out of debt, we had just a couple of thousand dollars left saved up. And I told the Lord, because I had a bad experience with debt, I told the Lord, I made a covenant with him, if you provide for me, I told him I will never go back into debt again. I'm not going to do it. Because the Bible says, and this has been my experience, that the uh, borrower, which was me, is a servant to the lender, which happened to be a relative of mine, who asked me to do some things that I had to say yes to because I owed the guy money. And so when I got out from underneath that, I told the Lord, I don't ever want to go into debt again. And uh, so we were leaving Kansas, and I saw a for sale sign. And I followed the for sale sign back in off the road for three miles, and we came to this beautiful, it was like a slice of Pennsylvania right in the middle of Kansas. And I'm like, the Lord has answered my prayer. And there was a nice little house sitting up on a hill. <laughs> and uh, 
So we called up about the price tag, and it was beyond what I had. And I remembered my covenant I made with the Lord. I'm not going into debt again. But I knew that I was supposed to buy that place. So this is the leading of the Spirit inside of you. When I saw that for sale sign, I had the witness of the Holy Ghost, this is where you're going to live. When I drove to that place and I prayed over it, I had that inward peace. This is where I want you to live. But I'd also made a covenant with the, with the Lord, I'm not going into debt again. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? What do you do in a time like that? You stick with your covenant. That's what you do. And I did. And so we ended up renting for the first two years we were in Kansas and ended up saving a little more money up. And one day I was out in town, and somebody said to me, Did you hear the Summers house burned down? I said, Yeah, I didn't hear that. Where's that at? And here it was the same place that uh, the Lord had took us out to and given us peace about buying. And so I called up the Summers, and here they had this beautiful eight, eight, uh, six or eight acres that was there. They wanted $8,000 for it. And we had about that much saved up at the time. And so we ended up buying the property. Now, I don't think the Lord burned the house down. <laughs> See, God is all-knowing. He knew somebody was going to be stupid and light a match that burned the house down. And he knew that was going to happen, and so he took me out to the place two years prior and said, you're going to live here. But he didn't give me any more information. I just stuck with my covenant. And we were able to buy the thing debt-free. And then I started going to auctions and buying all kinds of doors and windows and use this and use that and use lumber. And, and one day we had a whole pile of lumber, and I sent my crew out there, and they had a, had a, had a, a week or so off work. I said, Build me a house. And so that was the first house we lived in, which we just remodeled now 15 years later. So you've got to remodel every 15 years if you uh, use borrowed lumber for, or uh, use lumber from a, an auction and use windows and that kind of stuff. But uh, what I'm here to say today is that you don't always, you had the leading of the Spirit, and it's better than it was in the Old Covenant, but it's still a walk by faith. And you still trust the Lord, and you take a step at a time, and you allow the Lord to lead you and direct you, but you stick to your guns. You don't compromise. And you actually put the Lord on the spot and see if He can do it without you helping Him too much by making bank loans. So you can trust the Lord for anything if you can go to the bank and sign for it and make a 30-year loan. I'm, 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 I'm here now. If you buy a farm in Pennsylvania, you got to do a 100-year loan. That may or may not be faith. I'll let you figure that one out. But the river inside of us, the Holy Spirit leading inside of us is different than what it was under the old covenant. How much time have I got left? Seven minutes. Wow. That's an impossible situation. The giving of gifts is something that is different from what it was under the old covenant. It says in Hebrews, uh, or in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. And we see there's nine gifts of the Spirit, un and under the old covenant, at least seven of those operated quite frequently on priests and prophets and kings as the Holy Spirit would come upon them. The Holy Spirit would come upon somebody carnal like Saul, and he would prophesy. The Holy Spirit would lift. He would stop prophesying. And so the gifts of the Spirit were in the Old Covenant, at least seven of the nine, but under the new covenant, the apostle Paul says something different. He says, you're kings and priests. And he says, I would that you all prophesied. And I would that you all spoke in tongues. And so those nine gifts are available to us who had the Holy Ghost because the Holy Spirit is the giver of the gifts. And a lot of people try to make a big deal about, well, this is my gift, and that's your gift, and my gift, and your gift. It doesn't work that way with the gifts of the Spirit. If you have the Holy Spirit, you can operate in any one of the nine gifts. 
Over the years, I've operated in all of the nine gifts at one time or the other. Those nine, the gifts of healings, the workings of miracles, the gift of faith, the word of wisdom. Notice it's not wisdom, it's a word of wisdom. The word of knowledge, uh, discerning of spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues, and the gift of prophecy. If you have the Holy Spirit, now you've got to develop it. It still takes a step of faith. As you take the step of faith, as you exercise it, the Lord will honor you and will release that gift through you. And, and I want to see in our churches uh, a greater manifestation of those gifts through everybody. Uh, this is not a one-man show. Now, there's leaders that you're accountable to, and they should be demonstrating the gifts to you. They should be operating and flowing in it. But I want to see the laity operating the gifts. Uh, one of the things I've been really impressed with is Brother uh, Leroy uh, Detweiler's church up in Michigan. Uh, the overseer there is Brother Gene Bacon, one of the elders there. And uh, when you go to that church during the worship, they have a way to usher in the presence of God. Maybe this is what happens if you have more of that prophet anointing. Brother Gene's a prophet. You have that prophet anointing operating um, strongly as it seems like people are more released into that gift. But what's interesting is many times during their worship services, somebody will have a tongue, somebody will have an interpretation, somebody will have a prophecy, and they're there just... The laity is there ministering to each other during a worship service. And I, I'd like to see more of that. I, I'm not quite sure how that's to be exercised, but I, I, I sense the Lord wants to do more of that through our people. And this has to do with being available, being full of the Holy Ghost, coming to church, built up and walking in faith <coughs> with our tongues and our spirits yielded to the Spirit of God. Now also... With the day of Pentecost came the activation of a better covenant with better promises. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 6 says, But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, but how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Jeremiah 31 and verse 33 says, But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts. I will write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall no more every man teach every man his neighbor <coughs> and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Now, I want to, in closing, I want to turn somewhere, and I want to ask this question, because I've been pondering on this. Uh, and if you could pull up uh, John chapter 14 and verse 12. Now, Jesus was looking ahead to the outpouring of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost, and he said, as a result of that, as a result of that power coming upon my people, as a result of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, he said, there's something going to happen. Now, this is described in John 14, verse 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, tell that person beside you, that's me. I believe on the Lord. He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. Okay, so that's telling us if we believe on Jesus, we will do what Jesus did. This was not just for the first century church. This was for those that believe. This was a continuation until Jesus comes back. So he's going to do the works that Jesus did. What are the works that Jesus did? It's a good question. But it doesn't stop there. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. 
Now, there's a lot of people get tripped up on this. What does that mean? What are the greater works? What are the greater works? <laughs> if I would open that up to this room, I guarantee you, you'd have more opinions you can shake a stick at. Since I'm doing the preaching, I might as well give you mine, right? Here, here's some of the opinions that are out there. Some of the opinions go like this. Well, you know, Jesus was one person anointed of the Holy Ghost, but after the Holy Spirit fell, now we've got everybody anointed. So there's more Jesuses running around. And uh, so more will get done because there's more Jesuses. And so greater works is more getting done. Is that what that means? <laughs> then there's others who really try to point to the ministry of, of the Apostle Peter, where he walked down the street and his shadow healed people. And, and they like to point out things that the disciples did that Jesus never did. And they said, those are the greater works. You know, like the Apostle Paul, he sent out handkerchiefs and he healed people. And, and yet, when I look at what Peter did, and when I look at what Paul did, and then I go back and look at what Jesus did, it would be hard for me to say that Peter and Paul did more than what Jesus did. It's, it, it would really be a stretch for me to go there. I've tried going there in the past to explain this greater works business, but it doesn't fit that well. The reality of it is, is Jesus healed more people, raised more dead people, delivered more people, cleansed more lepers than Peter or Paul ever did on an individual basis. So you can't really make a real good case that these, as individuals, were doing greater works than what Jesus did uh, when it came to just miracles and healings. So what are the greater works? I believe the greatest or the best explanation, now this is my opinion, since I'm doing the preaching, I get the one to give the opinions. So my opinion is that the greater works were things that happened as a result of the new covenant that weren't happening in the old covenant. And I'll give you two things that were happening as a result of the new covenant. Something known as the born-again experience. People getting saved, born again. Now, there was an Old Testament version of that, but it wasn't the same as it was after the day of Pentecost. After the day of Pentecost, those thousands coming to the Lord and the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit coming upon them as they were being baptized, that born-again experience was a radical, life-changing experience. That's a greater work. And I think sometimes we just kind of take the opinion as a church, well, you know, they just got saved. No, it's a greater work. It's an awesome thing. It's the greatest miracle that God ever did when somebody gets born again. And I believe another greater work is the infilling of the Holy Ghost. The power of God coming on somebody. And so, uh, to me, those are two greater works that weren't happening before the outpouring on the day of Pentecost. And I think we ought to get more excited about doing greater works. And that's getting people saved and getting people filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. So Jesus said, You're gonna, if you believe, you'll do the works I did. What are the works that he did? Heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. That's what Paul was doing when he sent out the handkerchiefs. That's what Peter was doing when he was walking down the street. He was doing what Jesus was doing. It's not a greater work. It's what Jesus was doing. The greater work's a new birth. The greater work is the fire of the Holy Ghost coming on some carnal dude. Now, that's a greater work. You know, we just recently had that week of meetings in Kansas. It's been a little while now, maybe a month or two. And uh, one night, so we'd have these meetings, and then we'd shut down, and nobody would want to go home. And so my wife and I would find a corner to sit, and then the youth would start worshiping, and people would be hanging out and talking, and they weren't talking carnal stuff. There was a presence of the Lord there, and it, it, was, it was amazing. <clears throat> and then somebody trickle over and ask for prayer. And I mean, we saw so many wonderful things happen that week. Just, I mean, we would sit there. Church would be over by 
say, 8 o'clock, 8.30. And people would linger sometimes till 10, 11 o'clock at night. We hit midnight a couple of times, almost midnight a couple of times. And uh, there was one girl there that's been seeking the baptism of the Holy Ghost for years. And just She just couldn't get it. And I preached a message on religion. And uh, this hovering started taking place and the worshiping and just God moving different places in the room. It, it was really neat. And she came over to me and she said, uh, I need to get delivered from a religious spirit. I said, amen, let's get rid of that thing. I led her in a prayer renouncing that religious spirit. And I cast that thing out of her. And <laughs> this is the most amazing thing to me. Here comes this demon, comes up and out of her. And so I think that's a pretty good time to start speaking in tongues. So I started speaking in tongues. And I just asked the Lord to fill her. And all of a sudden, here comes the demon, and here goes the Holy Ghost, and she starts speaking in tongues. And I thought that's pretty awesome. What was blocking her was a religious spirit. The moment she got rid of that thing, there was an instant trade-off. Just, I mean, within seconds. That was so awesome. God is good. That, that's a greater work right there. You don't read of that happening under the Old Covenant. So I think we ought to get back to the greater works. Getting people saved. Getting people filled with the Holy Ghost. Get people walking in the Spirit again. Would you stand to your feet with me tonight?